A lot of us these days, we believe our phone is the enemy of our time. The phone is the enemy of a productive day. But the truth is this, distraction, not the device, is the enemy of the day. Disillusionment, dissatisfaction in how our life is going, this becomes the temptation in and of itself, this, this phone, if I set it right there, guess what happens? It doesn't chase me. As I put my phone down and, and go to do something else, the phone, like not like in a horror movie, comes after me, screaming at me, please, please, please pick me up and use me. The phone itself is not the temptation because it does not chase you. We choose Facebook over folding laundry, YouTube over mowing the lawn, Work, work emails over enjoying Saturday with the family. We prioritize porn over time with our kids. Instagram stories and reels over intimacy with God. Because of all of these things, and I could keep going, well-meaning people say it's the phones. The phones are evil. But I remind you, the phone that never gets picked up is not evil. It's not going to chase you. It doesn't chase me. So we believe that phones are evil. But the question is, what is the real problem? Is the phone the problem or is there something more sinister behind the phone? I mean, is, is this apple the problem or is it the same issue as this apple? When Eve takes the apple, the apple itself was not the problem. The apple itself was not evil. There was something behind the apple. Can the phone be used for good? Absolutely. Can the phone be used for evil? Yes. And today we're going to see that there's something behind the phone. There's something behind temptation. And the title given to him in the Bible is the devil. Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the snake, whatever name you want to get, there's something sinister behind the evil. Some of you guys have probably seen, most of us have seen the commercials now on TV. It shows these black and white te these commercials, and it shows some really cool looking scenes. And then it says, Jesus, he gets us. You've seen that? Jesus, he gets us. Raise your hand if you've seen those commercials. Jesus, he gets us. That's a true statement. Today, I want to give you another statement that I want you to go home with. The devil, he gets us. The devil, Satan, the enemy of our soul, he knows you, he knows humanity, and he gets us. The enemy of your soul. The Bible says he's crafty, he's smart, and he will use anything to distract you. He will use the disillusionment, the dissatisfaction, the longings in your heart, he knows us. The devil, he gets us. And I want you to keep mind of that as we go into 1 Thessalonians, as we jump back into the end of chapter 2. The end of chapter 2, remember the last time we saw Paul, he has Timothy, they had left Thessalonica. He was railroaded out of town. They chased him to Athens. They did not want him there anymore, but the gospel cannot be stopped. The new church is going. And so now Paul is writing back, and he's writing back a very heartfelt message. He loves these people. He sees what's happening. He cares for them, and he's going to tell them here at the end of chapter 2 exactly what he thinks of them. Verse 17, but as for us, brothers and sisters, he's talking about him and Timothy, the other leaders. After we were forced to leave you, remember they, wrote, they railroaded him out of time for a short time in person, but not in heart. We're not there in person, but man, we are praying for you. We are there for you in heart. We greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us for who is our hope oh, don't don't go keep don't go, keep going that's what we do right we're reading through this letter and we keep moving and we get to the part about that the church is our hope the church is our joy but you can't stop you have to stop for a second and see what paul says he's like listen we wanted to come back to you me and timothy man we long for you 
But our plans, what we really wanted to do, he's just going to say matter of factly, Satan hindered us. There's an evil force out there in our space time continuum here in our world. The Lord is present, but we have to see that there is an evil present. There's Satan. The Bible talks about a third of the angels followed the great angel Lucifer. And now we have a third of what used to be angels, now demons. And they are here. And they're in our midst. And we must understand that. You must understand the theological doctrine that Paul is saying here. He's saying it so matter-of-factly that sometimes we just blow through it. We were going to come. I long to see you. But Satan hindered us. Now, does he mean Satan specifically? Could be, because Paul's a pretty big deal. But when the Bible talks about Satan or the devil, he is, the Bible is talking about this, this presence of evil, the demons, Satan's minions that are around us. Paul believes in it. And he says it hindered us. And then we continue on. For who is our hope and our joy and our crown of our boasting in the presence of the Lord Jesus has, crum has coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. And many times, which is fine, we focus on that part of the story. But not today. When I was reading through this, and I'm going to read through all of chapter 3, you see that Paul understood there's a battle. And the battle is real. And if Paul himself and Timothy, and he throw it out there and say, this is what we were going to do, but Satan hindered us. I was railroaded out of town. I was beaten. Remember chapter 1, Jason, one of the Christian leaders, pulled out and beaten and questioned. There's a real battle going on. Don't miss it. It was normal for Paul, so let's continue on in chapter 3, verse 1 and following. Therefore, when we could stand it, no longer stand it. Again, he's talking about the emotion. He loves these people. We thought it was better to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. In fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience, uh-oh, what? Affliction. As you know, it happened. We got the snot beat out of us. We were chased out. They chased us all the way to Athens. Going to experience affliction, as you know, it happened. For this reason, when I could no longer stand it, meaning I longed for you, I missed you, I wanted to make sure that the gospel was continuing. I wanted to make sure the church was having the impact. I wanted to make sure that your new life in Christ was really growing. When I could stand it no longer, I also sent him, Timothy, to find out about your faith. To find out about your faith. Remember we talked about here, faith is the conviction of what you really believe. He's not talking in faith like we've turned it into a generality. What faith are you? I'm the Buddhist faith. I'm this faith. I'm... This is, he's talking about faith, your faith, what you are convicted of. I also sent him to find out about what are you convicted of? What drives you? What do you really believe? Fearing, and here it is again, the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be for nothing. Other translations say our labor would be in vain. What's he saying? I sent Timothy back. I wanted him to check your faith. What do you really believe about the gospel? I wanted him to check your faith to see if it was strong. Why? Because the tempter, Satan, devil, the demons, the temptations, the tempter gives temptations. And I wanted, watch this, I wanted to make sure that as you were doing church, as your life was changing, as you're living out the gospel, that you would not give in to the tempter who tempts you because if you do, and it takes you off course, he's talking about the church and the church's mission, then everything we would have done would be in vain. You can't miss that. We were going to come back, but Satan hindered us. We're sending Timothy back to check because we want to make sure your faith is strong so that you don't give in to temptation. Because if you, church leaders, if these Christian homes 
begin to give in to temptation. Maybe for those who are Jews, they go back to their Judaism. They go back to that religion. Maybe they're just Roman citizens, and they say, you know what? We like Rome. We like getting our money. We like our, our businesses. We'll go back to uh, worshiping all these different gods. He said we had to make sure. Because if you give in to temptation, then all of a sudden with the, what God is doing in the gospel, what's happening, it turns to chaos. And everything we would have done would be in vain, would be for nothing. You have to talk, pause right there. He's talking about the church and church leaders, but the same is true for you and I in our families, in the lives that we live. If we're followers of Christ and we give in to the tempter, the temptation, and we continue to do that, and we have the consequences, then guess what? Things blow up, and the, what you wanted to see happen in your family, what you wanted to see happen maybe in your company, what you wanted to see happen in this church, things don't just happen. They can implode. And that's what Paul is saying, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor could be in vain. Moms and dads, make sure that your labor for the gospel in your family doesn't go in vain because you give in to temptation. I'm going to read the rest of it relatively fast because I want you to see. Paul's just writing this letter, this Holy Spirit letter, and woven in the letter... Behind the scenes almost is, you better understand you're in a battle. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. He brought good news. You're not giving in to the tempter. He reported you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us and we, as we long to see you. Verse 7, therefore, brothers and sisters, in our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you, through your faith, through your conviction, the gospel continues. Lives are being changed. We're so, uh, so proud of that, and it keeps us going. And watch this. For now we live. If you stand firm in the Lord, say it here all times, the if-then clause. We are not robots. Everything hasn't been predetermined. We have willful decisions. There's an enemy that we must look out for and Paul says, if you keep your faith, we are so encouraged that this will continue to happen for the gospel. The lives will be changed if you stand firm. Why did Paul say this? Because he knows the devil, Satan, he gets us. He knows exactly what we're doing. Verse 9, how can we thank God for you in return? for all the joy and experience for God because of you, as we pray very earnestly night and day to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus, watch this, direct our way to you. Direct our way. Other translations say clear your way. The word there, the phrase there is, here's the path. Remember he already said, Satan hindered us. We're in a battle. So we're going to pray that God clears the way. Think of maybe like snow, right? A plow clears the way. You're going through the woods. A bush hog clears the way. That's the word there. We're going to pray. What's he clearing the way for? The evil one. Those who would stand against Paul and the gospel. He's going to clear the way. Verse 12, and may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another, for everyone. Just as we do for you, may he take your hearts blameless, may he make your hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Paul writes this letter. And so many times we pick out the other things. But woven through these verses is you're in a battle. There's an enemy of your soul, an enemy of Christianity, an enemy of the church. So many people think, well, I felt when I came to Christ, the guy on TV, he said I'd have this blessed life and everything would go perfect. Let me remind you what 2 Timothy, Paul again, says, chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Will be persecuted. Why? Because you're in a fight. There's a Satan. There's a devil and his minions. He hates your very soul. 
He hates your kids. I don't know if I can get this through enough. He hates your life. He hates everything about it. He's behind the persecution. So we want to talk about this enemy. And we need to know that, that Satan, he gets us. And the enemy of your soul is real. We've created a Christianity that, that doesn't believe in evil that doesn't believe that there's a, a, an army against us while we have an army fighting for us. Paul was just matter of fact about this. And only fools, listen, only fools think there's no battle. Only fools don't prepare every day. As Paul says here, we're praying for you. We're praying for ourselves because we know we have an enemy who hates us hates the local church, hates the gospel, hates communities, hates governments that try to do the right thing for Christ. Now, before we go any further with the, your enemy is real, we need to make sure we have a proper doctrine, a proper theology of Satan, evil. Here's what we need to know. We're just going to call him the devil, right? The devil is not, a, does not have the ability to be everywhere. God is everywhere. Satan is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. So if right now he's in Yugoslavia or if he's in Africa or he's at the White House, wherever he, he can't be here. And so you need to understand that because the devil can't be everywhere, let's make sure we get a proper teaching doctrine of the devil. You come out of your house, you're like, Oh, man, I got a nail in my tire. My car didn't start. The day is going back. The devil's after me. The devil is not after you. First of all, you're not that important. I'm not that important. But he can't be everywhere at once. The devil doesn't know everything. Do you think the devil knows what's going to happen next Saturday? The answer is no. He's not omniscient. He doesn't have all the power and all the knowledge. Only God does. Is Satan very crafty and smart? Does he see things going? Does he know he's manipulating? Does he see what's happening? Could he make a good guess? Yes. But he doesn't know. He's a created being. He does not know what you are having for breakfast tomorrow. God does. He's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. And he cannot be everywhere. You get that, right? But he is in the dominion of darkness. The third of the angels, we call them demons. We can't just say, well, that's just for horror shows. No, 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 no. It's real. Paul talks about it here. And we must know that he's very powerful. He's very smart. He's very crafty. He's very evil. He knows how you think. He knows how governments think. When political parties go directly against biblical truth and values, you think that's just happen chance? Do you think the nutcase of Hitler? Do you think there wasn't a diabolical, sinister, evil plot between killing all those Jews? Hundreds of thousands of lives, millions of lives killed in these senseless World War II battles. You don't think there was something Behind that, do you not believe that there's something behind when people and governments push for the innocent lives to be executed in abortion? When an abortion goes on, there's a screech of sadness in heaven. Oh, but there's a chuckling of joy. <laughs> we got these idiots believing that abortion, as was told to many of us in our government, let's use that to help the economy. That should make your heart turn. It makes the heart of God burn in sadness. And it makes your enemy chuckle and laugh and think this is incredible. When second and third grade middle schoolers are groomed to doubt their God-given gender? You don't think there's something sinister behind that? You better wake up. We better wake up. The devil is crafty. He knows. He knows what will get us. He knows how to, to kill countries, how to ruin lives. We are foolish if we think there's not something sinister behind that. 
enemy of your soul who hates your family is real. And you better wake up and start to really believe him. He's not only just very real. The Bible says he is always roaming. Always roaming. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. What does that mean? Well, if you've ever been drunk, you don't know what you... Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. It's not a joke. It's not just throwing that in there. Now, again, here, like in all the Bible, it talks about the devil. The devil can't be everywhere, but there's evil. There's dominions. There's evil in the world, people doing evil things. And so we must see that we have a real enemy. And the Bible is clear, going around like a lion to devour your kids, to devour your very soul, to kill your family, to have you give in to temptation. Remember, Paul, we're sending Timothy back to see what you really believe, to see if you're so convicted that you will not give in to the tempter and give in to temptation. Because if that happens, we fear that everything we've done would be done in vain. Do you not think that your family, that this church, that everything happening can be done in vain if we give in to temptation? He's always roaming. And it's a challenge. Over the last many, many, many years, I've had people come to me and say, Kenny, I need to tell you something, man. I've given my life to Christ. I've become a Christian I mean, I'm loving everybody. I'm serving. Listen, I am working with middle schoolers. I am serving. My wife and I arranged our budget. We're now giving on a regular basis. I love, serve, give, and share. I've never been more committed to Christ. I started reading my Bible, and then I know what's coming. I can see it in their eyes. And they go, and my life has never been more challenged. As a matter of fact, it's just horrible right now. I lost my job. My grandmother died of cancer. I got this going on. I feel like everything is going wrong. Inside, I'm like, wow, you truly are a Christian because now you're in the game. Outside, I don't say that. I don't laugh. Outside, I'm like, wow, yeah. That's what happens when you now are fighting when you now have a faith that's convicted, the evil one, the enemy of your soul, is against you. I've had other people who are like, you know, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time. Business has never been better. Family's never been better. I don't ever feel like there's any problems. You probably better check to see if you're actually in the game. I think you may be over here on the bench. Still a Christian, but you're not making a difference, so... <laughs> The, say, the evil one doesn't have to go over you. Doesn't have to try to wreck your family, wreck your life. Always roaming. Do you ever understand the idea of clear the way? I want to go back to that. Paul said, we're praying to clear the way. We make fun of it now, but I was growing up in my, my Baptist church. We would always pray as we leave, Lord, give us a hedge of protection. And now we, we make fun of that. Comedians make fun of that. Hedge of protection. Here's the deal. Where do we get that phrase? In Job, Satan says, oh, I could get Job to curse you, but you have a hedge of protection around him. Take down the hedge. I will make him curse you. We know the story. Job loses everything. It's brutal. God says you can't take his life, which reminds us, anything that happens evil, God knows. Satan has to have God's permission. Does it happen? Absolutely. We live in an evil, evil world. But God's in control. He can stop it at any time. And so this hedge of protection, I want to encourage us to go back. Go back to thinking about praying before you leave that the Lord would send heaven's armies to protect you. A couple of days ago, it was pouring down rain. I think it rains every Sunday, but it was pouring down rain again. We've moved out to the country the roads are slick. They're skinny. It's awesome. There's some country roads. The speed limit is still 55 miles an hour. It's awesome. It's like the Autobahn. It's just go. But when it's wet, we well, can become a little dangerous. So as my son was leaving to come to church, 
I had this in my mind, and I, I kind of laughed to myself. I said, make sure you drive safely. Make sure you don't drive too fast on these wet, curvy roads. Yeah, 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 whatever, and he left. And as he left, I said, Lord, put a hedge of protection around him. Lord, put a hedge of protection around him. Do you believe that if so inclined, and the Lord allowed it, but so inclined that an evil force can, can knock a car off the road? If you don't think it could happen, you're foolish. It absolutely can. And so we better get used to and start praying for heaven's armies to give a hedge of protection. Can you also slide off the road because there's no devil and you're just dumb and you're driving too fast? Sure. But I'm praying. I'm praying on my way here for you, for me, that God would clear a way. I want to encourage you. If you have not in a long time, go back to praying for a hedge of protection. For God to clear the way, especially when you know there's a devil and he gets us. There's a devil and he's like a roaring lion. So I want the all-powerful, all-knowing God to know that I believe there's a God and I'm not it. And so God, I want you who is all-powerful. I want you who can be everywhere. I want you who lives inside of me to protect me. Don't be so arrogant to think that you don't need that. Many of us have slipped into that. Paul said, we were hindered. We're going to go that way, and now we're praying that God will clear the path, that he will clear the way. The enemy of your soul is also a relentless tempter. A relentless tempter. Again, he hates you. He's also very smart. Question for you. Do you think... For normal males, since the beginning of time, about age 18 to 24, do you think that the temptations that drive a normal male between the age of 18 and 20, you think that's changed a whole lot? No. Nah. Do you think the temptation for the mom who's about 36 to 40, who's had a couple of kids, kind of thinking about what life could have been, should have been, you think that that's changed over the centuries? No. It's the same issue Ma and Pa Ingalls had on Little House in the Prairie. Nothing much has changed except for the device. Phones, but phones aren't evil. They don't chase you. There's always been something that Satan would use. Why? Because he's really smart. He's crafty. He hates your soul. He hates your life. And he will be a relentless tempter. He will always be tempting. He knows you're disillusioned. You're dissatisfied. He knows that you want to feel valued. Is it okay to feel valued? Is it okay to feel like you've been accepted? Of course it is. But the enemy tempts you to get what is good and normal through wrong connections. And you're no different than people your age doing the same thing you're doing for centuries. You better wake up. There's a devil. and He gets us. Now one thing we need to understand about the relentless tempter. Those of us who are Christians. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Right? We're Christians. God lives inside of us. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So those Christians. Because that's true. That's awesome. And because that's true. Then we also need to know. That when, when you were at Walmart the other day, and the person came down the aisle dressed in a certain way, don't know if they were meant to be dressed provocatively, but they were. And when you were there, and things went into your mind, Satan cannot put thoughts into your mind. You're like, you mean when I thought that about him, when I thought that about her, when I thought this about my taxes, when I wanted to fudge a little bit over here, when I didn't want to, well, well, if that's not Satan, who is it? That's you. Down the road, there was temptations you gave into. Down the road, there was things that have, that have twisted your head just a little bit. My mind also. 
But when I am tempted, you got to get out of this idea that there's this internal force that if Satan could, if a demon could get into your brain, you'd be freaked out all the time. If you're a Christian, well, can can a person be uh, uh, possessed if they're not a Christian? Absolutely. When you're scrolling on your on your Fox News and you see, oh, somebody got, took a lot of little girls in their basement, cut them up, and ate them. They've been really warped, or there was something sinister and evil inside that person. Many a times, they've been so jacked up, they've been given into so much temptation, their mind has gone crazy. Can it happen to non-Christians? Yes. To you, if you're a Christian, no. Where'd that thought come from? You. That's why Paul says all through the New Testament, clean up your mind. Understand. He's a relentless tempter. And you and I need to understand when we give into this temptation, be very wary that what you're praying for, that what you're working for. Paul says, give in to the tempter and the temptation, and it could be in vain. We live in a cause and effect world, and we better wake up. We better wake up, but here's the good news. Your faith is the greatest defense against the enemy. Your faith. That's why Paul kept saying, I'm checking on your faith. I was good to hear about your faith. James 4, 7, 8 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Don't be double-minded. Be one-minded, single-minded, clear. Don't be, uh, be, be sober-minded. Same thing. When we resist the devil, we draw closer to God. Your faith in Jesus, the greatest defense against the enemy. Your faith says, give me that heads of protection. Help me to stand up against temptation. I want to draw closer to you. We don't give in to temptation when we are truly in the faith, meaning when we're truly convicted. When I'm truly convicted of what God says, that sin breaks the heart of God, then when I turn on my phone, turn on this, whenever the temptation is there, if you truly believe, this breaks the heart of God. It makes it easier. When you truly believe that sin is wrong because God said so, doesn't matter what the school say, what the politicians say, doesn't matter what false teachers say. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. And when you're convicted of that, you steer further away. But also that you're convicted that sin has consequences. I've experienced them, you've experienced them, so let's stay away from them. Our faith, what you truly believe, the problem is our Christianity has now morphed into you can do what you want, believe what you want, and God's just going to love you because, because Jesus, he gets us. He does. But we have an enemy who gets us the exact same. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. We need to understand there's an enemy. But if we have faith in Christ and we are Christians, you don't have to go to bed scared. You just got to pray. You got to ask the Lord to give you that strength from inside because Satan is in complete submission to God. So the only people who really have to fear are those who have not given their life to Christ. Because the enemy of your soul hates you, hates your family. And when you breathe your last, wants you to spend eternity separated from God. Do you know who God is? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes as our band comes out. During this song, I want you to think about who is the Lord? What does he do in my life? 